Unit seven, um, the, fa the last unit for, um, for the 2019, 2020 year because of the quarantine, uh, but obviously for other years, we're gonna go beyond for units uh, eight and nine as well. Uh, this one's gonna be talking about motivation, emotion, and personality. Uh, and I actually like how they changed this unit because a lot of these are, are intertwined. Uh, your motivations uh, are linked to and are driven by your personality, uh, and then your emotional response and your temperament um, are gonna be also, of course, linked to your personality. Uh, potentially your motivations and, and your conscious knowledge of, of what's going on. So uh, I think it's a good uh, way to, to condense these units. So first we're going to talk about motivation. So that's what we're talking about on this uh, lecture slash notebook, whatever. Uh, motivation. So you've probably heard of it. I'm probably, I know you've heard of it uh, and even gripped by it. But the way it's kind of defined is it's, um, it's like an internal sort of uh, phenomenon that uh, energizes you and uh, compels you to uh, uh, manifest a certain behavior, act a certain way, do a certain thing. Um, and you, you've all experienced it before. Uh, and the weird thing about motivations is you can't pick your motivations. Uh, they are, and this is kind of a personality thing, temperament thing, uh, an inherited thing. The things you like and the things that drive you and energize you to do things, um, you can't pick them. Uh, otherwise, we would just pick all the qualities we like. Um, we are, to some degree, unfortunately, stuck with the motivations that we are, are handed or handed as they develop, I guess just to say. Um, not all of your actions are dictated specifically by this uh, energetic, um, uh, compelling force uh, that, that a motivation actually is. So that's like when you get up and you want to do something and you've got the energy and the attitude to go do it. And you're like, I need to do this. And you feel uh, happy about it and you just go out and you go and, and do it. And there's not really any hangups about, oh, I just don't want to do it. And you, you, you don't feel lethargic. Uh, you don't come up with excuses. Uh, you just get up and you do it and you want to do it. Um, those sorts of things, those motivations, again, those are somehow deeply rooted and embedded, uh, uh, probably in our limbic systems, but even if it's in our frontal lobe, uh, we're not particularly aware of what they are. Um, so sometimes uh, you have to do things you are not motivated to do, uh, like study or write a paper or work out or whatever it might be, uh, or eat a certain way, uh, diet and exercise, because you know it's good for you, but it's not wired into you to be this sort of uh, uh, intrinsic motivation, intrinsic meaning, of course, um, you would just naturally want to do it or desire to do it. <clears throat> and that's what's going to uh, complicate motivation. So again, it's sort of an internal uh, um, energizing uh, which uh, directs behavior. Now again, uh, you can do things that you're not motivated to do. Like, even if you're motivated to do something else, you can stop yourself. Um, like, you'll be motivated to get up and do something fun, or eat something delicious or whatever, uh, but you might know it's not a good idea, and you might be able to consciously hold yourself back. But that, that desire, that drive, that energy to go pursue that, um, you can't pick it. You're just... It's just what you have or don't have as far as what you want to do and what you're energized uh, to go out and do. That's why some days it's easier to get up and do things than it is uh, on other days. Um, and uh, we can't just decide what we like doing. Uh, like, for example, I'm not motivated to... What's something I detest doing? I hate all forms of paperwork uh, and bureaucracy. So I have no motivation whatsoever uh, to try to uh, write down exactly uh, what I'm doing, what I should be doing, making this sort of bureaucratic structure, submitting paperwork, taxes, things like that. I hate those things. Um, I have no motivation to them whatsoever. Uh, I am motivated, however, to, to learn things and, and, and talk about them and make videos and uh, content for, for teaching and for, for, for learning for students. Um, I don't need to be forced to do these things. I enjoy them. Uh, I, I think about them and they actually you know, spark some energy in me, and I go out and pursue them uh, as, as well as I can. Um, obviously, there's days where you're sick and things like that where um, your motivations might be hindered, but uh, that's what we call uh, an incentive. So I, I, I like going out and doing these things, um, and doing them makes me happy, so it's, it's an incentive. It encourages a behavior. So because I'm energized to do this thing and it makes me feel good, it's what's called an intrinsic uh, motivation. So um, you can have incentive. Uh, which is basically uh, positive or negative stimuli. 
uh, that uh, encourages uh, a specific behavior or avoidance of a behavior. Like I might be motivated not to go uh, down a dark alley because of uh, some fear I might have or whatever, right? It's a, it's a feeling that's energizing me to run and leave instead of go down that, that hallway. But usually we refer to it as something you're um, uh, driven to do for the most part. So the two types, I already mentioned one is intrinsic. Uh, this is my own in internal uh, motivation for doing something. It's just a natural desire to want to do it. Um, the common example I give is um, Kobe Bryant, for example, who just passed away, unfortunately. Um, or Michael Jordan, anybody. <clears throat> Those guys obviously want to be paid a lot of money because they're the best at what they do, but that's not their primary motivation. Their intrinsic motivation, the thing that they that gets them up every day and makes them work hard, especially you know years before they were paid or acknowledged for any of this, whether it was in high school or whatever as they're growing up in college, um, they just had this desire to go out and be the best basketball player they can be, uh, to be better than whoever or be, be better than they were the day before, whatever it might be. Uh, they're intrinsically energized to go out and do that. Uh, and that, by the way, is the strongest form of motivation uh, is intrinsic. Instinct is too, which we'll talk about in a second, but uh, things that you naturally enjoy, that you're naturally rewarded for and naturally energized for, the best motivation by far as far as actually consistently doing that thing. Um, the other type is extrinsic. This is, of course, um, something from the outside. This would be an external motivation. Uh, so this is something that I don't, uh, I'm not directly driven by because I want to do it or I feel good doing it or whatever it might be. Um, it, it's something, I'm, uh, some reward I'm getting externally in some other way. So the best example in this one is, is money. But you could really use anything from like... Uh, from behaviorism as far as operant conditioning anyway. Like uh, any of those rewards and, and incentives or disincentives you're using, those are extrinsic, right? Like uh, teaching your dog to sit. When you say sit, you, you, uh, the extrinsic uh, motivation is going to be um, uh, the, the treat, right? The reward, uh, the food in that case. Um, they're not driven to sit just because they actually want to, they're driven because you'll reward them with uh, something uh, on the outside. Um, Money would be a good example of encouraging somebody to do something you could offer them money for it. Um, they're probably not gonna get particularly excited about it, depending on what it is, but you could motivate them to do something uh, if, you, if you pay them. So uh, that could work for the, even the basketball example. Um, some players are, at least to some degree, if not entirely, but certainly to some degree, motivated by uh, being paid, right? They want money, so uh, they'll try something new or try something more difficult or try working with somebody else to a certain coach uh, to, to fulfill some contractual obligation that pays them. So money is definitely part of that uh, internal drive, but, um, or sorry, part of that uh, motivation. But uh, the internal drive is gonna be the strongest, but uh, extrinsic motivations work too. You can, you can bribe or encourage people to do something or not do something with, with external rewards uh, or punishments. Uh, but it's not as effective as if people naturally are, are motivated to do something. In fact, I should actually mention, if somebody's intrinsically motivated and you try to uh, get them to do it more often by adding extrinsic rewards, uh, it actually has the opposite effect. It actually decreases their motivation and likelihood they will do it. So let's say, for example, I'm super motivated to uh, uh, um, make these videos. Um, if I'm already doing them about as much as I can and you're like, well, I, you know, we, we would like you to make a few more, so here's X amount of money to do it. Um, I might accept that from whoever's randomly giving me money for that, uh, but I might accept that proposition, but I'm actually going to lose motivation because I'm going beyond what I naturally want to do. Uh, so that, even though I naturally want to do it, the amount that I'm doing it or who I'm doing it for, or the way I'm doing it, whatever you're paying me to do, um, that's actually going to be against my uh, internal motivations, and that's actually going to decrease my enjoyment and the likelihood that I will do it, or at least do it with as much enthusiasm uh, or as consistently. Uh, that's known as the uh, over-justification effect. So if somebody's already intrinsically motivated to do something and you try to extrinsically motivate them to do something else, they no longer like doing it. Uh, another good example is like how uh, sometimes rock or, or musical artists get burnt out, or actors or whoever. Um, when you pay them to go on tour for two years, uh, playing the same songs over and over, 
uh, they get tired of it. They get tired of being on the road. They get tired of performing. They get tired of um, uh, singing the same songs over and over. Uh, so they, while they may have been intrinsically motivated to make their music and, and perform it and write it, um, which is, of course, an intrinsic motivation uh, and very strong, uh, you making them do it more when, than they want to for money is going to actually make them uh, dislike it more in the future. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, bands and other things that go on tour or pay to do things can actually get kind of jaded and, 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 and lose interest and become less motivated. That's called the overjustification effect. Uh, that's when you try to uh, uh, add... Uh, to enhance the behavior in some way or modify it. Uh, and that actually uh, equals uh, less motivation in the long run, in most cases. Uh, but that's essentially how motivation works as far as uh, incentives. There's another form of motivation that's perhaps stronger, certainly in animals because they're not aware of it. Uh, it's what's called an instinct. I should say non-human animals. An instinct is a, an unlearned behavior Um, that uh, is often uh, rigid in a, in, a, in a species. Another behavior uh, that is um, programmed rigidly in a species. When I say programmed, I mean kind of like computer program. I talk about your brain specifically. Um, so an instinct is something you know how to do without anybody teaching you to do it. Uh, you're driven to do it, right? You're, you're energized or motivated. Uh, doing it likely makes you feel happy or, or or whatever, you some sort of positive emotion. Uh, and um, it's across the species. So even if I, let's take uh, salmon, for example. Uh, salmon, they have the instinct of, well, first of all, going out to the ocean for however many months or years. And then randomly at the same time, they uh, all come back and do the exact same thing. They go up to the, their home river somehow, uh, and then they uh, uh, lay their eggs essentially and then die. And nobody, necessarily needs to teach them to do that. You could separate the salmon so that they like aren't as a group or they don't you know, travel together. Uh, you could separate them, it wouldn't matter. They all uh, instinctively, uh, at a particular time, are all motivated to go back to their home uh, lake or whatever reservoir or whatever body of water they're from uh, to, uh, to lay their eggs. Uh, and uh, again, it's not learned uh, and it's across the whole species. So what that tells us is they have some sort of circuitry wired in uh, through the processes of evolution, that this instinct somehow improved their reproductive success and uh, uh, it was passed on to the point that that whole species now has that ex exact same set of circuits that are activated and motivate them and energ energize them to do a specific behavior. Um, so you know, humans have some, for example, we uh, instinctively clasp our hands um, uh, as infants when something comes into them. Um, we instinctively, uh, We'll, we'll like, uh, you know, for feeding purposes anyway, um, uh, root and latch. Uh, so like, you don't, sometimes kids might be developmentally behind uh, as far as their, their uh, coordination and muscle development goes. Uh, but for the most part, all humans, assuming that there was a, a normal set of circumstances for birth, have this instinct of, of rooting and sucking, uh, obviously to, uh, to save their own lives, <clears throat> uh, to eat outside of the womb. Despite having no despite having not been taught that. Like they were sitting there in their mother's womb for their entire lives for all the nine or 10 months it was, fed by an umbilical cord, not um, you know, uh, uh, rooting or sucking on anything uh, outside of, uh, of that or doing it at all. And then as soon as they come out of the, the uh, womb, without even teaching them how to, they'll automatically, uh, for the most part, know how to, to, uh, how to eat. Um, another example, this one's actually kind of my favorite. Squirrels. Squirrels, um, they are always hiding uh, acorns and nuts and things like that. They do it constantly all year, um, and they're driven to do it. It's an instinct. They all do it, um, well, instinctively, uh, without even being taught necessarily. And the reason why we know it's an instinct is, first of all, because they'll do it even if they're not taught it. But second of all, uh, we know that it enhanced their survival because the squirrels that are compelled to or energized to go catch these, take these acorns or nuts and hide them, wherever they're hiding them, uh, allows them to later in the winter... Um, find them again and, and eat them so they can survive when there's not a lot of food around. And the reason why we know that um, it's not planned, it's not like they're like thinking, oh, winter's coming, I better hide some acorns or the nuts or whatever. Uh, they know that it's just random because they often find less than 80% of the stuff that they hid. So they go all this work hiding all these nuts and acorns all over the place and they find almost none of them. Um, 
it's just an instinct that they are, are motivated to like find these things and hide them. Uh, and even though they're not consciously doing it for a reason, remembering where they are, uh, they can find them later uh, by chance. And that's what keeps them alive. So those squirrels that had that set of circuits uh, that functioned as that instinct, they kept living because during the winter they would have food um, because they were compelled to just you know, find these things and store them. Whereas the other rodents that didn't do that died off because they wouldn't survive the winter. So that's what an example of a motivation is in the form of instinct uh, versus an incentive. All right, a couple of things I forgot to mention on the motivation section um, was, or was actually one thing I forgot to mention about the over-justification effect. So I already just discussed it for the most part. Justification effect. About how, you know, you can uh, actually decrease motivation by uh, adding an extrinsic, extrinsic motivation to intrinsic uh, motivations, one that are already self-driven. Uh, one element I forgot to describe is the fact that you can actually, it, it's an odd phenomenon paradox. So if somebody's already intrinsically motivated and you add the, the external motivation, the extrinsic one, uh, like money or, or prizes or award or winning some sort of, you know, bowl game or whatever it might be. Um, once that ex extrinsic motivation is introduced and becomes an integral part of that person's motivation, uh, oftentimes that now becomes necessary to continue uh, the behavior, or, or at least the motivation for the energizing behavior. So, you know, if you offer this extrinsic reward, uh, and then later on you pull it away for whatever reason, whether it's salary or prize, uh, the, the possibility of getting that or getting more, uh, the person will no longer be motivated to uh, do that, perform that task uh, anymore. So it could be like, you know, early songwriters who are, you know, pumping out all kinds of music, and even though they're getting no money for it, it's just because they want to, and, and maybe later on they want to get recognition for it, but, but they probably just like the music. Um, but then later on, if they do get famous or semi-famous and they get paid for it, they get awards for it or whatever it might be a recognition, uh, that actually becomes the source of their motivation to the point that if for some reason that were to go away, um, whether it was the awards, the attention or the uh, money for it, they would no longer be motivated to do it otherwise. Uh, you could not you know, hope to see them as energized and their behaviors directed towards uh, these goals <coughs> yeah, with the absence of that extrinsic motivation. So it's not like it's a sure thing. There's certainly individuals that can uh, continue to or, or return to or, or withhold a part of their intrinsic motivation, but uh, this is a phenomenon that is fairly common. Uh, so again, uh, or the extrinsic, uh, paradoxically, uh, reduces or replaces uh, that intrinsic motivation. All right. Uh, a couple other theories that we uh, didn't quite mention was um, there were two more that are on uh, research projects for my class that I forgot that I included my notes. So when I look at my notes, I see what I want to talk about. I forgot that these were even on there. Uh, there is another phenomenon referred to as achievement motivation. This one's actually linked closely to personality. Uh, this is somebody who is generally motivated it can be a combination, by the way, of, of extrinsic and intrinsic. Generally motivated by a sense of achievement. I don't mean like, oh, uh, someone's happy you did it. Uh, but specifically somebody who is motivated to do something because it's difficult or risky. So it, it's, it's considered an achievement to uh, accomplish the task um, in a certain matter of time or to a certain quality or, or even completing it at all or competing it uh, or completing it in relation to others, like it's sort of a competitive thing, like how they do it better or just as good as professionals or, or whatever it might be. Um, so this is actually kind of a, uh, at least they try to measure it as a part of trait personality. Um, this is a, I would say melded with temperament, with temperament, so your, your own predisposition. Um, uh, it's kind of uh, one's own uh, desire uh, to achieve, or overcome tasks uh, that are of intermediate, at least intermediate, but still possible, uh, risk or difficulty. And in fact, these sorts of people uh, who, like if you give them a bunch of options, like you can do these three things and like uh, one is really easy, and one is kind of easy and the other one's pretty difficult but doable, uh, they're much more likely as a person to consistently pick the more difficult of the task, as long as it's not overwhelmingly difficult. 
Um, so these are people that, that kind of like the challenge and they, it's kind of almost a little bit with a zone of proximal development or, or just personal growth. Uh, it's somebody who's ex trying to, or is motivated to exist on the edge of their ability. So they want to test themselves, right? They want to do things that are um, somewhat difficult or risky that most people won't try or can't do. They think they can. Um, so they're more likely to pursue it and they're also more likely to reasonably assess it and succeed. So they're not necessarily just overconfident and they'll blow it. They consistently choose uh, tasks that are achievement oriented, whether it means getting social recognition or just you know their own confirmation of how competent they are. Um, they're more likely to choose it and they're also more likely to succeed than others. So they consistently pick it and they more consistently accomplish and, and achieve that goal, uh, whether it's for social reputation or for money or whatever it might be. Um, so uh, consistently, or I should say more consistently, more consistently. Uh, choose and uh, accomplish uh, goals of uh, that intermediate risk or difficulty. Uh, and again, that's that's something that excites people. Uh, they're they're not likely to do things that are easy or uh, seen as too easy by them. They want things that are, to them at least, some form of. Uh, achievement because it's it, again it's somewhat risky or, or somewhat difficult to do uh, and that, that motivates them to go and, and do that task whereas you know normally if it were considered easy they would not choose to do so but because it's got that degree of difficulty at risk that actually uh, energizes them uh, and directs or compels their their behavior to go and accomplish that goal all right and then um, the next one the last one for motivation is a phenomenon known as motivation um, uh, conflict theory. So this conflict theory is kind of a situational thing that that dictates one's behavior. So part of motivation, of course, is uh, this sort of energy that directs your behavior and, and, and incentivizes you kind of to do something. Um, that can also be weighed against other alternatives because the choices we make, like if I'm motivated to go do something, uh, there's an opportunity cost, meaning I have to usually give something up to accomplish the goal. Usually it's time, it might be money, it might be other opportunities, but you're giving something up to pursue uh, that goal, engage in that behavior. So let's let's say it's, um, well there's basically three possibilities here. So the, the motivation conflict theory is basically you are uh, weighing uh, alternate opportunities. when deciding how to act. So this is a situation where uh, you want something, but there's something else that, uh, is, that also has to be considered. You can only do one of the things. You have a, and it might be more than, than just the two. Uh, so you got at least two choices, perhaps more, but we'll just keep it simple and say two. You got two choices, right? You can do something. So there is a situation where um, you want to do something, but you fear a bad outcome. So it's kind of like a, 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 a benefit and a, and a con, or a pro and a con, a contra. So um, that would be referred to, I believe, as approach avoidance conflict. The approach, of course, being the positive, like, oh, I'm gonna go do that thing because I want the, the positive outcome, or oh, I'm gonna avoid it because I don't want to uh, be, caught up in the negative outcome. So an example for this one could be, and this is a common one, um, a scenario where hmm, it's common in that we often, of course, have to choose between something we want and then uh, a potentially bad outcome, or at least something we have to endure that's bad. So this could be as simple as like going to the gym. So if you want to go to the gym, you know that there's a good outcome, right? And you approach one, you, oh, you want to go and become fit and have a better physique or be in better shape or perform better at your sport. There's a lot of pros to that. But there's also some contras. Uh, number one, it's very time consuming. Uh, it could be expensive depending on your financial situation uh, relative to the amount of money you have. Uh, and it's certainly gonna be painful, uh, literally painful in that you could get injured, um, but also painful, uh, not like, you know, uh, shockingly painful, but painful in that you're gonna have to go strain for, you know, 45 to minutes to an hour uh, and a half a day or however, they, however, often, you, however often you end up going. 
um, and for however long. But those are going to be strenuous if you're doing it right. Uh, and uh, they'll cause you to be sore the next day. You'll be exhausted perhaps afterward. So there's a lot of discomfort that comes along with that. So that's going to really affect your, your motivation and the actual behavior. Uh, so basically uh, weighing a uh, benefit with a uh, detriment, something you don't enjoy or discomfort, right? And that's a good example. Uh, gym, going to the gym equals uh, benefit. Or benefit is gonna be uh, a better shape, appearance, whatever it might be that you're going for. Uh, but a, uh, a, a detriment would be the uh, uh, discomfort, time, money, etc. That are used to do that. Another example might be a more simple one, uh, whether you're a boy or a girl. If you are looking to, well, you're attracted to somebody, like I said, boy or girl, um, and you want to approach them, uh, because the, the positive part, the approach part is, oh, you want to form a romantic connection with them, or potentially, right? Uh, but the uh, avoidance part would be, if you're rejected, that's really going to hurt. So that's going to be a conflict in you internally, uh, as far as your motivation to actually go and do it or not. Um, so that's, that's going to be the first element of it. The second one is, um, so obviously we did a positive negative here. So now we're going to do like a double, like a positive positive. So this is an approach approach. Conflict. It's still a conflict though, because you can only do one or the other. Uh, so this is a, a case where uh, both outcomes are, are good. Uh, but you still have to choose uh, which one you want. So. Um, this one's harder to think of, um, for some reason. Okay, let's see, you only have $10, and, um, you're at, uh, In-N-Out, or whatever, and, uh, you could, you want two different meals that are, are both good to you. Uh, you're gonna be, you're gonna be motivated to choose both, but you can only choose one, uh, so you're gonna have to weigh which one you would rather pick, essentially. Uh, that's the opportunity cost, so, um, I haven't been there so long, I forgot what all the orders are. Uh, but let's just say, um... Let's just say, I know $10 would buy you more than this, but so let's reduce it to $5. You only got five bucks, uh, and you can either get a double-double, which is delicious to you, it is to me, my mouth just watered, uh, or uh, you get animal-style fries, preferably with no grilled onions if you're me, but hey, you can have them if you like the grilled onions. But you can't get both, right? So it's gonna depend on which one you're more motivated to eat, and that can be difficult. In fact, these conflicts are much more difficult the more equal the two outcomes are. Uh, so if one's, if the benefit and the, the uh, detriment are about equal, like, oh, the, the, the potential benefit's really good, but also the, the potential detriment is pretty awful, it's gonna be really hard to pick. Same with the uh, approach approach. Uh, if they're both positive, then you're gonna be, uh, and, they're, and they're both about the same as far as how positive they are, how much you enjoy them. It's gonna be really hard to pick which one uh, you actually go through with. And then, of course, you've got the final uh, selection or choice here, which is avoidance, avoidance. That's where both outcomes suck. Both bad outcomes. And again, in all cases here, uh, the more equal the uh, options, as far as how much you enjoy or, or not enjoy them, uh, the harder the decision. And that makes sense. So avoid, avoid, let's say you were uh, sick, you have, I don't know, you've got uh, cancer or something. Uh, in your arm, I'm just making this up, obviously. Uh, so you got, the doctor says you got two options. Number one, we amputate the arm and you live, or number two, you go through chemotherapy, which is gonna suck, but you keep your arm and you will, uh, you, you might live, you have a good chance of it. So you're gonna have a tough choice then. Do you choose the 100% uh, guaranteed route and chop the arm off and go look your whole life without your arm? Or do you suffer the months of chemotherapy, which are terrible, uh, but uh, likely live and then uh, get to keep your arm? Right, but there's that small chance of it not working and, and you end up perishing. So that the closer the two are in as far as how, um, how good or bad they are to you uh, is gonna make this more difficult. But that's essentially what the motivation conflict theory is. Uh, uh, it's usually a choice between a good and a bad or two goods or two bads, essentially. So that's motivation. Um, let's look at the specific motivations we might have. So first we'll look at um, how we go about what, what sort of drives our behavior as far as our needs go, uh, how that works, at least to some extent. And then uh, our, our three major drives uh, for our behaviors. And a drive, by the way, is something that, that compels you uh, to act. Uh, and it's slightly different than motivation, but it's definitely in the same uh, realm. 
uh, or categories. So first, let's talk about uh, a human need here, uh, which is what we refer to as uh, um, sort of defines our existence. It's what you call a homeostasis. So uh, uh, same existence or internal existence. Uh, basically, what that's going to mean is uh, uh, an internal, I should say, a steady internal state. You're like, what the hell does that mean? A steady internal state is when you feel completely satisfied and not desiring anything else. Uh, you're not uncomfortable, essentially. So homeostasis means I am not hungry, I am not thirsty, I, um, I don't have to go to the bathroom. Those are all things that make me feel uncomfortable, right? You go to the bathroom because it, like, it, it burns or it... it it becomes painful at a point, depending on you know the situation and what you have to do. But um, uh, you feel uncomfortable. That's probably a better way of phrasing it. Uh, when you have to go to the bathroom, that's why you go. You go to get rid of the discomfort. Uh, you go to the bathroom and let out. Ah, that feels better. Um, you go back to your your internal state of steadiness. Because when you feel uncomfortable, it's not a, a, a steady internal state. It's a, an anxious or 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 aroused um, or or upset state essentially. Uh, same thing with hunger. You eat, well, partially because you enjoy it, because we've, you know, found these foods that are perfect as far as our taste buds go. We enjoy them. We get nice little physiological dopamine hits from them, and it, it just tastes good. But assuming you didn't have those things, like Reese's and Sour Patch Kids and things like that, let's say it was just like standard nature, Paleolithic era, all I got are hunting and gathering. Um, the reason why I eat is because I get hungry. Uh, and the hunger like hurts, it's very uncomfortable. So uh, it motivates you to go and uh, uh, end this discomfort, this hunger. That's why you eat historically. So animals that uh, had this hunger drive would constantly be seeking out uh, food, which is really just energy, resources, so you can keep creating and maintaining cells and keeping your life going. Um, so any creatures that were born without uh, hunger, this state of discomfort when they're hungry, didn't like care to go out and look for food, uh, and then they would, you know, obviously be uh, uh, more prone to dying of starvation uh, or have less resistance to uh, potential diseases, so they would die off. Whereas uh, us unhappy, hungry folk would be constantly, every day, looking for uh, energy, food, and that would, uh, of course, keep us alive, uh, keep our cells uh, operating, um, maintain themselves, and make us resistant to uh, infection. Same thing for thirst. Uh, when you feel thirsty, um, it's, you're, it's really uncomfortable. Uh, so the thing that dominates your behavior and mind is, uh, man, I need a drink of something. Like you preferably water, obviously, but you can uh, extend that to other uh, types of drinks. But that's what homeostasis is. It's the state of not feeling uncomfortable. It's feeling nice and comfortable and satiated. But if that's ever upset, like you have to go to the bathroom or you're hungry or you're thirsty, any sort of um, 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 discomfort that you experience, uh, it's going to uh, drive you or motivate you uh, to uh, fulfill uh, that need, that thing that you require, uh, to expel the toxins from your body uh, by going to the bathroom or to uh, take in water so you can hydrate and your body can break down the uh, ATP and, and, and function. Its cells can send, uh, pass on energy between each other. Uh, and then, of course, the food, too, so you can uh, have the energy and build the materials to, to create and maintain cells. Um, you need those three things. Those are needs, all right? So needs. Uh, here's some of them. Uh, you need to uh, eat. You need food. You need to uh, drink water. We'll just put drink because it doesn't have to be water necessarily, but... Well, it doesn't need to be water. Even if you're drinking other things, the thing you need is the H2O because that's part of your uh, uh, use of energy as far as ATP goes. So uh, eat. Uh, so we'll put food. You need calories. There we go. Energy in the form of food. Uh, you also need water. You also need several other things. You need to go to the bathroom uh, to e expel uh, debris or toxins from your body. Uh, you need to um, reproduce. Um, reproduce. Okay, you need, uh, at least as a human, you need social interaction. Uh, you need to breathe. <laughs> You need oxygen, so I should put oxygen, but not too much. Um, those are all things you need. If without them, you will die or suffer immensely and then die. 
Um, those, are, those aren't all of them, but those are some. So whenever your body or mind is lacking these things, um, whether it's uh, potential offspring in the future, or it's uh, ha having friends and connections around you, or it's literally just like physiologically, the oxygen you need uh, to breathe, and the water you need uh, to break down energy along with the oxygen, uh, and the energy you need to, to build and, and move your, your cells in your body, uh, and the need to expel these debris, the debris and toxins that you've acquired as cells have broken down, you've consumed things. Um, if you don't do these things, you'll die. Well, you go crazy and die, or you'll just die. Um, so the reason why we fulfill these is not all animals are aware they need these things, right? It, you, you can't ask a dog what it needs. It doesn't know. Uh, all it knows is it feels uncomfortable uh, when it's hungry or thirsty. So what does it do? It goes to get rid of that discomfort by drinking or eating or whatever. All right. Uh, and obviously dogs are one of the smarter animals, but you can go down as uh, unintelligent as you want down to lizards and things like that. Um, they're motivated uh, to fulfill these needs, not because they're aware of them. They don't like think about, oh, wow, future me is going to die if I don't feed myself now. They don't know. They just wait around and when they start feeling hungry, it sucks. So they go around and look for food to make themselves not feel hungry. So these needs are fulfilled not by our conscious brains, obviously as humans we can, but evolutionarily as we evolved as a species and other animals exist, uh, we're not consciously aware of those things. Uh, we are uh, motivated to um, eat or drink or go to the bathroom or whatever uh, because of our drives. And the drives basically uh, are, it's a form of motivation. It definitely energizes you uh, to, uh, to uh, part to, you know, carry out a certain behavior. Um, but these are, um, it's energized to uh, uh, fulfill a need. Basically, that's what a drive is. So you're like, well, what's an example? All right, well, if, I'm, if I need energy and food, and let's say I'm not a human and I don't know that I need that, um, I would die if I didn't eat food. So what makes me want to eat food? The discomfort of hunger. So the drive to fulfill my energy needs, uh, the drive is actually gonna be hunger. That's going to energize and motivate me to fulfill one of these needs. So I'm hungry, so I'll go out and find food. Right, if I'm a hyena or a lion, I go out to, to, uh, to kill or, or, or find something and eat something that was killed. If I'm a giraffe, I uh, go try to uh, eat leaves off of a, what are those trees are called and all those things. Like that's what drives animals, including us, to eat what we eat because uh, we feel hungry and it's uncomfortable. Uh, same thing goes for uh, uh, drinking. We need to drink water uh, to be able to survive, to break down uh, energy. Um, uh, and use it for uh, our own existence, uh, maintenance of our cells, etc. So uh, animals don't know, they can't plan ahead for the most part, most animals can't, um, and think, oh, I need water or I'm gonna die. Uh, they don't know that, they just know they feel thirsty, uh, and then they have to go out and find water, right? And that actually generally tends to keep them around sources of water, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the thing that makes you feel uncomfortable and wanna drink like I wanna do right now, in fact, I will, uh, that's thirst. That's my drive. Um, for fulfilling this need, thirst. Um, you can do this for all of them. We'll just do a couple more. Uh, to expel the debris, that's when you get the discomfort um, uh, to, to fulfill this need of, 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 of um, uh, you know, ridding yourself of debris and toxins. Um, so that's the sensation of having a discomfort of, uh, of a full bladder. Uh, or or a bowels or rectum or whatever it might be. Uh, whichever one you're going to end up doing. So uh, they all have uh, examples. You can tie the drive for oxygen. Try holding your breath. It's not very comfortable, right? You get you uh, have this intense uh, feeling of discomfort and dread uh, when you lack oxygen. Um, so that very intense discomfort causes you, of course, to breathe or find air very quickly so you can do that. Um, uh, social interactions. Um, if you are uh, what drives you to talk to people and see them and form relationships, well, you'll feel lonely and miserable if you don't. Even if you're an introvert, uh, you need some interaction with humans. Um, and uh, you know when you need to interact more, even if you don't plan on it, uh, because you'll feel lonely. You'll, you'll feel like you want to see people. You'll feel bored and you'll go out and you'll find that. Uh, reproduction, I mean, that's just basic sex drive or, or the desire to find a loving partner uh, to, raise, to raise kids with. Um, there is some difference on average between males and females. Males tend to prefer quantity uh, of partners. Uh, whereas females tend to prefer, on average we're talking, not individually, um, quality of partner. And there's evolutionary reasons for that. Males, for example, can uh, birth as many children as they want at the same time uh, because they're not the ones carrying it. 
Uh, so they could theoretically uh, have multiple children being born at the same time, uh, or as women go through the stages of uh, gestation, they can only do the one pregnancy at a time. They're increasingly vulnerable uh, during that point, so they, on average, tend to seek partners that are of higher quality and competency, whereas uh, males are, are more so driven for, for quantity evolutionarily. But nonetheless, um, those are all uh, various uh, forms uh, and needs and drives. By the way, that doesn't, that's not condoning um, mal behavior, or no, uh, damaging behaviors relationally by males just because they're more uh, evolutionary promiscuous on average. That doesn't um, uh, justify things that they do or don't do that, that uh, violate um, relational relationships. What do I say relationships? Okay, so I was to say spouses, but it doesn't even need to be spouses. Anyways, so that's homeostasis, uh, and that's our, um, what has kept us alive actually, these drives, this discomfort that fulfill, cause us or energize or compel us to fulfill uh, needs that we literally actually need to survive. So um, let's go over some specific drives uh, to kind of conclude. We'll go over three. We'll go over, what are the ones they want us to go over? Hunger, social drive, and sex drive. I think that's the three that they highlight in uh, unit seven. So let's do hunger first. There are actually several factors here. Um, no, actually, no. First, let's go over drive theories before I go over the specific drives. Drive theories. So there's two. And actually, I've described both of them to you uh, indirectly, but I've defined them. Uh, one is known as arousal theory, and the other is known as drive reduction theory. Uh, I already explained this one to you. Drive reduction theory is basically um, when homeostasis is, is not being maintained, like you're running low on water or air or food or whatever, or you're, you're, you're uh, not having you don't have social contact. Um, you'll get a state of discomfort, uh, a disrupted internal state. You'll be hungry, thirsty, etc. Uh, so because it's uncomfortable, what, do you, what are you motivated to do? You're, of course, motivated or driven uh, to get rid of that discomfort uh, and fulfill a need. So uh, drive reduction theory, um, behavior uh, is uh, um, uh, motivated or driven uh, by desire, to maintain homeostasis, specifically uh, to avoid discomfort, right? And you know that what that feels like. Hungry, thirsty, gotta go to the bathroom, etc. lonely. Uh, those are all uncomfortable, uh, that's discomfort, and that's uh, gonna drive you or motivate you to, uh, to fulfill that need, even if you don't know it, right? And that's why animals can fulfill those needs without planning or knowing why they need them. They just feel uncomfortable and they know that they can feel uh, comfortable by or go back to their homeostasis state uh, by, by uh, eating or drinking or whatever it might be. Arousal theory. This one's slightly different. This one uh, basically states that people have varying levels of arousal. So like energy. Uh, arousal means like essentially your body is energized, attuned, and focused to uh, accomplishing something. Um, whether it's watching something, doing something, whatever it might be. Um, so uh, if, uh, if you're really excited or having a good time, uh, you are definitely in a state of arousal in that your blood pressure and heart rate are higher, uh, your, uh, your, your optical, um, uh, the occipital lobe in your brain's more active because you're, 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 you're in the moment observing what's going on, your pupils are probably dilated um, because you're, you're trying to absorb as much as you can. Uh, that more so depends on the availability of light, but nonetheless, your body is in a heightened state of awareness uh, because you are uh, either enjoying or perhaps worried about, because you can also be aroused by fear. Um, this is where you are uh, hyper-energized, essentially. Um, so arousal theory states that you, there's kind of a couple options here. Number one, uh, that if you are, if you are um, not meeting your homeostatic state of arousal, uh, you will feel bored. So uh, those moments when uh, you or somebody you know is like, let's go do something. Let's go watch a movie. Let's go to a park. Let's go to the beach, whatever it might be. 
because they're bored. That's a good example of arousal theory where somebody has reached the point where they're under aroused, like they feel too lazy or lethargic, they get bored. So what do they do? Their body motivates them to go do something. So they think of an idea that it pops in their head, like that sounds fun. They become aroused and they go and pursue that um, interest or whatever it might be, all right? And there's also the opposite too. There's people that can be overly aroused. Um, so if you are, uh, if you exceed your homeostatic, and again, when I'm saying homeostatic here, I mean internally feeling steady, right? So you are, you're happy with the way things are. So like if I'm, if I'm, uh, if my, according to arousal theory, if I'm in a state of homeostasis, I don't, I'm good. Like I don't need to go do something. I don't need to oh, avoid something. I'm like, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. It's perfect. It's fine. I'm good. Um, the two I'm ex explaining here is one where I'm, I'm lacking arousal and I, I want to, so I feel bored. Uh, so then I'm, I, I try to go out and do something uh, to make myself feel more aroused. Uh, and, and maintain that content homeostasis. Uh, you can also have the reverse too, uh, where if you exceed your homeostatic uh, state of arousal, so you're over aroused, like you're actually exhausted by the event, uh, whether it's a social event or it's, or it's rock, like you did, let's say you went rock climbing or skydiving and it freaked you out, and so now you feel like exhausted uh, and you feel uh, like you can't even be anxious anymore because you're just so drained by, um, you know, going out and, and going to the, I don't know, the EDM uh, festival or whatever it might be that you went out to because you thought it'd be fun. And now you're tired and you're exhausted. Um, you're overstimulated. Uh, your, your arousal state has uh, exceeded your homeostasis. So when you are over that state of arousal, uh, you, of course, do the opposite of, of going out and seeking things. You, uh, you, you uh, re not regress, but you sort of, not even isolate, I can't think of the word. Um, you pull back, basically, you relax. Um, so if you exceed that, uh, you are motivated, motivated to rest or relax, right? So that's where you're like, you're like okay, I've had enough of this festival, let's go home. Um, you know, I've, 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 I've done enough talking, uh, I've done enough teaching or learning, you're overly aroused or overly stimulated by what you've done. Uh, you're exhausted, you're burnt out on it, then of course you pull back and you relax and, and let go. Um, so this arousal theory, of course, that's the two extremes. Once you've gone beyond the state, state of arousal, whether you've exceeded it or you've or exceeded or you've or gone below it, rather, um, exceeded or gone below, then that's going to uh, uh, dictate what you do or don't do. Um, the caveat to this is there's no knowing what that state is for each person. So for example, um, somebody who has a really, really high level of arousal that's optimal for them, so they feel like they're at homeostasis when they're really aroused, they're gonna wanna do stuff all the time. They can get bored quick. Um, so that's someone who's constantly going uh, uh, on adventures or to different restaurants or doing different things or uh, has to like, I don't know, uh, those guys that do rock climbing, cliff, cliff climbing with like no rope, like they are way up there for their level of arousal that's optimal uh, because that's way beyond most of us what we'd want to do. We'd be like, whoa, that's dangerous. No, thanks, I'm good. Uh, they, however, feel bored unless they're doing extreme things. Um, so it's highly individual. Highly individualized uh, levels of optimal arousal. Right, so those people that uh, stay home a lot, they don't really have a, a, a high state of arousal that's optimal for them. That their homeostasis is much lower than somebody who is constantly wanting to go and do something. So extroverts for the most part tend to be more on the higher level here. So they are really sensitive to positive emotion. They constantly seek it out. Uh, they want to be aroused and stimulated. So as a result, they go out and do more things and see more people and they enjoy it more. It makes them feel fulfilled. That's a personality feature, but it's linked to this. Introverts on the other end, other, other hand, they uh, require very little uh, arousal, at least social arousal. So uh, they oftentimes don't venture out of their house and they do less things. And then when they do them, they probably enjoy them less uh, because uh, their uh, optimal state of arousal is much lower than somebody that's high. So uh, it's individualized. You never know. Well, you, you might be able to know by looking at someone's behavior, but uh, for the most part, it varies from person to person. All right. 
Those are the drive theories. <clears throat> now let's quickly go over the three primary drives. First is hunger. There are several different um, ways to look at this. So hunger drive obviously is uh, what what drives us to eat. You, you feel hungry and you eat, but it's not purely just hunger. So we all understand that we eat because um, we need the food and we feel hungry, we might get rid of that discomfort. But there's some variables here. So first of all, there's a biological variable. And this has to do with somebody's uh, homeostasis regarding uh, how, how, how much food they wanna eat, how much food that they're uh, driven to eat. Um, biologically, um, we are influenced by the production of a chemical or hormone called uh, ghrelin or ghrelin from the lower intestine. That's what uh, travels up to your hypothalamus in your brain and makes you feel hungry or not. And they know this works because they've tested it. They can um, add the ghrelin, ghrelin synthetically to make people feel hungry. They can also, um, they're doing this with rats, if you apply lesions to the hypothalamus, it will either make them extremely hungry all the time uh, or it will make them not hungry at all, not interested in food at all. So there are some very specific biological uh, functions that dictate somebody's hunger. So how much you eat, how much you want to eat, how frequently you want to eat uh, can be dictated at least partially by uh, the uh, presence of uh, ghrelin, uh, which is a hormone from the low, small intestine, and uh, the, that interaction with the hypothalamus. Uh, which is uh, part of the endocrine system uh, to some extent. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what, in fact, there's a disorder called Prater, Prater Willi syndrome, where um, it's really unfortunate, it's really rare, um, where they have an undersized or oversized, I think it's undersized hypothalamus. And uh, at around age two or three or five, somewhere between three, ages three and five, um, the, the malformation in their hypothalamus causes them to be constantly hungry all the time. Doesn't matter how much they eat, they will never not feel hungry. If their stomach's technically full, they'll still feel hungry. And they, of course, uh, have some severe eating disorders and weight issues uh, as they age. So that's really unfortunate. Um, physiologically, so neurochemically, uh, what, you, what, you, what your brain desires and needs. Physiologically, um, it's also driven by our uh, dopamine reward centers. Centers. Specifically, uh, high calorie density food. So high calorie density means it's a very small amount of food, but it's got a lot of calories in it, right? So for example, I could take an apple, which is roughly like 80 calories or something like that. And it's, you know, it's like a baseball size. Uh, but if I could re Reese's peanut butter cup, which is probably a 10th of the size, maybe even less, it's actually got 120 calories. So there's actually more energy in a Reese's cup because it's smaller uh, it's got it's more it's higher in what's called calorie density. Um, we tend to like calorie dense foods because, according to uh, evolutionary psychology, of course, if we like and find food sources that have higher calorie densities, that's likely to keep us alive, uh, and, and it promotes the reproduction of our and continuation of our species. So the fact that we like foods that are sugary or or potentially salty or high in, 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 fent, uh, fence, in fat content and, and sugar carbohydrates and, and protein for, for like meat and muscle tissue. Um, the reason why we like those is, well, first of all, we need them. So us liking them, them tasting good to us, uh, makes us, gives us that reward center, gives us that boost. Oh my gosh, that feels great. And that's kept us alive because we pursue those foods that help keep us alive. But um, nowadays, since we don't have a shortage of food uh, and we can go get cheap food very quickly and we've figured out how to activate our re reward centers for food. They've like, you know, literally engineered these pieces of food that are perfect as far as making you feel uh, really satisfied by eating them even if you're not hungry, like, you know, candy and all kinds of sweets and, 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 and meats and all kinds of things that they make. Um, <clears throat> they cause you to eat a very small amount of food that's very high in calorie density and it tastes really good, so you enjoy it even if you're not hungry, uh, which uh, of course promotes overeating and has contributed to uh, the sort of uh, uh, weight gain slash obesity epidemic of, uh, of our contemporary world, which is the first time in human history the problem has been too much food as opposed to too little. All right, uh, there's also some social influences too. So, and this is another evolutionary psych psychology 
phenomenon or factor. They think uh, we tend to eat more in groups, so that promotes us getting into groups, and when we're in groups, we eat more, so that's better for our overall health uh, and survival. Um, so uh, we are what you call social eaters. And think about it. You know this, every time you go out to meet with somebody socially, guaranteed it's gonna center around, at least at one point, food. And in fact, if you're gonna meet and there's no food involved, people are gonna leave pretty quickly. Um, so that, that just became sort of one of the, 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 the primary attractions or features of our social interactions. Uh, so uh, social eaters, looks like it says enters. But uh, that's not it. There's also a phenomenon known as the buffet effect, which uh, basically states that if there's more food available, like you have a bitter, bigger selection, you're gonna eat more just because you enjoy trying the other things. Uh, and yeah, I'm sure you know this is true. If you go to a buffet, obviously you wanna get your money's worth because you usually pay quite a bit to eat you know, your fill. But you're actually likely to eat more even if you didn't pay for it because just the fact that there's such a wide variety, you, because you enjoy or wanna try them, uh, are willing to eat beyond what you normally would. Uh, maybe even what would have made you full, you'll keep eating because they taste good, you wanna try them or whatever. Uh, that's the buffet effect. And um, yeah, that's pretty much hunger as far as hunger drives go. Uh, next, let's do sex drive. Hunger drive. All right, uh, sex drive, obviously, it's one that was passed on evolutionarily because those creatures that had high sex drives and engaged in it often were much more likely to, of course, have kids, multiple kids, which... Um, increase the likelihood that, that their genes would keep getting passed on, their species would keep existing. So sex drive is, uh, it, it's, it's instinctual and it's driven uh, largely uh, by pleasure uh, and pleasure seeking and also uh, relationally as far as forming emotional connections uh, with others. Uh, so first of all, you can actually look at it um, physiologically and even biologically um, with um, hormones can actually affect the uh, sex drive. Generally speaking, males, um, if you increase the amount of testosterone in their body, they will, generally speaking, have a higher sex drive or libido. Uh, women's libido can often be enhanced by uh, adding estrogen. So uh, those hormones can't, it doesn't mean that like all of a sudden you go from zero to insane sex drive, but um, the presence of a greater amount of testosterone or estrogen, generally speaking, in males and females, will uh, uh, does correlate with their with their uh, libidos, right, their sex drive. Um, a lot of what we know, though, about sex and, 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 and our drives uh, and our desire to do it um, come from a researcher known as Alfred Kinsey. Um, he did most of his research on sex. I think he started in the 30s, but his publications that came out and were very controversial at the time because it was a lot more of a conservative environment. Um, his publications came out in the 1940s and 50s um, about um, sexual behavior. Uh, his first book was about men, the sexual behavior of men. That came out in like 47 or 49. Men was, I think, 40, 1947. It might be 49. Um, and then he had another book, which was even more popular, uh, on women. And that came out in 1953 or 4. One of those two. Uh, 40s and 50s, though. And that, if, if you don't know your history, that's a pretty conservative time where people were generally a lot more religious uh, and traditional. And historically speaking, in, in most, almost all human societies, sexual behavior has been taboo. Uh, taboo meaning um, like socially unacceptable or, or, or awkward to talk about or discouraged, at least publicly. It was something that you just did in the privacy of your own home. Um, and largely still is, but it's something you didn't even talk about. Um, it, was, it was awkward to do or it was immoral depending on your stance religiously. Uh, so again, somebody considered taboo, something you shouldn't do. It's a, it's a social norm not to talk about it at all and not have anything known about it for the most part. But Kinsey did a, a lot of research on sexual behavior. So the, he discovered a few things um, when, when learning about this. Uh, first of all, we know that Males and females, because uh, this wasn't known so much about females before, uh, are driven by, uh, this, this sex drive is driven by um, uh, another reward, a pleasure-seeking uh, center. So he, he kind of coined the term and, and, and defined uh, the uh, sexual response cycle. Uh, and there's four stages to that, that 
I'm having trouble remembering off the top of my head. The first stage is excitement. Then it's plateau. Then it's, which means like, you know, capped out, maximized almost. Um, like if the excitement is your increasing excitement, I mean physiologically like uh, heart rate goes up, blood pressure grows, goes up, uh, the genitalia become more uh, aroused, increasing their surface area for males and females. Um, uh, one, well, obviously they have different uh, variations of that, but becoming sexually aroused, uh, you get up to a point where you kind of like maximize your sexual arousal. Your heart rate and blood pressure are, are at maximum. Um, the genitalia are as engorged uh, uh, or, 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 or lubricated or whatever they're going to be uh, naturally on their own. Uh, they've kind of peaked. Uh, and then uh, what occurs next, of course, for males and potentially females too, uh, is, is orgasm. That's the, the pleasure-seeking portion uh, where they experience uh, contractions uh, and you get a, a surge of neurochemical, um, uh, pleasure-oriented neurochemicals, which of course is largely what drives this behavior, uh, is achieving that. And then uh, after that state, there's a, a, a state of, of regression uh, known as resolution, where basically uh, it just kind of goes back down to, to normal. Uh, the uh, genitalia uh, appearance and, and size uh, and the um, heart rate, blood pressure, all that, go back to the normal homeostatic state. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, cycle that they have. So he did a lot of research on this, um, discovering several things about uh, behavior, how sexual behavior, how people just basically like a lot of different things um, as far as uh, when they're actually engaging in sexual intercourse. Uh, he discovered a lot about um, uh, male preferences, discovered a lot about female preferences and details, uh, which of course was not known to the public for the most part. Some of his books got published, they were controversial, mostly to more conservative uh, religious groups and thinkers, uh, but uh, nonetheless, they were bestsellers of their time by a large margin because everybody wanted to know about these things. It was just taboo to do so, uh, essentially. So um, he did that. Mm. So not only did he make, he made, um, made sex, well, behavior, behavior uh, less taboo, but also he did some, some things as well. Uh, he ha helped lead the, um, paved the way for the sexual revolution, which is basically just making, talking about, and engaging in uh, sexual behaviors <clears throat> uh, and for women particularly, um, allowing them to sort of know what they want and pursue what they want. Um, as far as sexual behavior goes, uh, it's going to lead to the, the, the forerunner to the, what's called the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and he contributed to that. But he also did a great deal for um, uh, homosexuals too because his, his research included homosexual sexual behavior. Uh, and what I... What I when I, when I, my understanding was it was a non-judgmental way as well. It was just like, what do you do, what do you like, et cetera, what, how to, basically how, it, how their drives work and their orientations work. Um, he created what's called the uh, uh, Kinsey scale um, for not even seeing uh, homosexuality and heterosexuality as like defined like either you just like the same uh, gender or you only like the opposite gender. He made it like a spectrum, uh, like you could be somewhat oriented to this one uh, or mostly oriented to this one, but have some preference to some degree for the other. Uh, and that was uh, Kinsey's scale of uh, sexuality. Uh, and I believe the zero was for completely homosexual, like you only liked the same sex, and six was completely heterosexual, you only liked uh, the opposite sex. So zero to six. Uh, six being uh, opposite sex, uh, zero being um, the uh, same. Obviously, the closer to a zero, the more um, homosexually oriented you are. The closer to six, the more heterosexually oriented you are. And I believe the numbers are roughly, um, uh, from his and other studies, there's been a bunch of studies afterwards, uh, it's roughly 97% heterosexual. And then in that 3%, you've got... Um, for women, I believe it's 2% bisexual, 1% um, homosexual, and then for men, I think it's 2% homosexual, 1% bisexual in that same 3%. Uh, and that's roughly uh, what it looks like. But if you look at it like this, like a spectrum, you can have some people, even in the 97%, that might lean a little bit more towards a lower number than a, than a complete uh, whole six. So uh, that's essentially sex drive uh, in Alfred Kinsey's 
contributions to that uh, as far as assessing it psychologically and physiologically. Um, and also, too, uh, he helped, of course, consolidate the, uh, the, um, um, the findings about men preferring quantity and women preferring quality on average. I uh, give explanations for that, but again, that's uh, he or anybody else has written about it. It's not like a condoning of, 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 uh, of male behavior that might be more promiscuous. It's just an explanation for why the drive might be higher. <clears throat> All right, lastly, social drives. Um, we're actually social creatures. Um, so we uh, require some degree of social interaction. Uh, and arousal. And again, it does vary based on talking about arousal theory. You have different optimal levels of, of social arousal. Some people require higher amounts. They're more extroverted, so they need to have more people around to talk to and interact with more people. More people that are on the low extroversion scale, as far as personality goes, or what you consider introverts, they uh, are lower on that arousal scale, so they are, of course, going to require and, and pursue less social interaction. But we are motivated to do that, and there's a couple evolutionary reasons for that. Uh, first one being, of course, um, there's safety in groups. So it makes sense that we are driven to uh, seek some sort of social connection regardless because there's safety in groups. So it could mean, first of all, more protection from threats, whether it's uh, other human beings or animals. Um, there's more eyes and ears and and, and arms and weapons and brains to think about and spot and fight against any threats. Um, also, they're just there for, for reciprocity. So, um, you know, if I help somebody out when they're sick or injured and they would have otherwise died and they live, now there and other people around me are likely to do the same for me. So if people are around me, there's a network of people, someone gets hurt or sick or they're vulnerable for some reason, uh, you can pick up the slack for them and help protect them and nurse them to health or whatever it might be. Um, so there's safety in groups, right, for protection, as well as um, aid, of course, like they're recovering from an injury or whatever. Um, and that's deeply, deeply rooted in our own behavior. Um, obviously, some people are more sensitive to uh, loneliness or more prone to loneliness than others. Um, and that's why we have that arousal theory to kind of explain how we're individually uh, molded differently to desire different levels of arousal. But we all desire it. And in fact, if you raise... Uh, humans or monkeys like we talked about with uh, the Harry Harlow um, experiments where you would uh, raise certain monkeys in isolation, they would literally go crazy and be completely um, antisocial afterwards. It just totally messed them up permanently and they led much shorter life, had much shorter lifespans. Um, or you look at prison reports of where you're basically putting people with the most violent um, and uh, potentially uh, atrocious uh, group in, in, in one building and the worst thing you can do is isolate them. Uh, that, that actually does more psychological and, and, and physical damage to them than being with these people who are also antisocial, which is, again, the worst thing you do is put a very antisocial person uh, with uh, a bunch of other antisocial people. Uh, but even that is preferable to isolating them. Uh, that's how deep the drive is. Um, so safety in groups, but also uh, just for procreation. Procreation. Uh, you need partners uh, to uh, promote your species. So those that didn't like, uh, uh, didn't have sex drives or didn't like being around people, uh, they passed their genes on less. So the ones that do have these drives, like humans and others, um, we just inherited them because that kept our species in the past going and allowed us to continue evolutionarily. But this also uh, affects our behavior in that we are um, extremely sensitive uh, to acceptance. In fact, there's a humanist, uh, which we'll talk about later, uh, Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow. He has a whole theory on this called the hierarchy of needs. Hierarchy of needs. Um, basically, uh, we'll get to him when we talk about humanism, but um, essentially, he kind of has this pyramid, this hierarchy of things we need to, to, to live and lead functional lives and, you know, be optimally happy. Uh, at the bottom, of course, are your physiological needs of like, you know, food, water, et cetera. Um, and then up over that would be like shelter and safety. Um, so if you don't have those things, you're in a constant state of, uns of, 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 of um, you're, you're not maintaining homeostasis. So if you don't feel safe or don't have a place to live or food or water, that's gonna be your focus. You're gonna be very stressed out about that. Once you have those though, the next tier uh, step up is actually acceptance. So you have your physiological needs, your shelter and safety, but right with that, 
uh, right around the same as your safety and shelter is also your need to be accepted by others. Um, so we are very sensitive to acceptance. Uh, that means what I'm saying, but what I mean by that is we want people to like us. So we are very prone to and sensitive to people not accepting or not liking us. It hurts. It actually physically, you feel pain psychologically and physically if somebody rejects you, for example, or someone doesn't like you or criticizes you even potentially, even if they might not dislike you. We're very, very sensitive to negative uh, social uh, interactions, being ostracized, alienated, kicked out, rejected. Those things really hurt really, really bad. Um, and the reason why is we are very sensitive evolutionary to people liking us. Uh, and it's important, at least evolutionarily, that people like you because uh, if they don't like you, you die. You get kicked out of the group, so now you are much less likely to pass on your green genes by point the camera cut out without me realizing it but fortunately I only had like a minute left uh, all I'm finishing up on is explaining basically how this uh, desire to be liked is uh, can be seen evolutionarily uh, because not being accepted by the group or uh, being ostracized uh, could leave you uh, potentially in harm's way but also uh, obviously your chances of survival are increased by being accepted and liked by the group and we can see that in today's society too with our uh, preoccupation uh, generally speaking, uh, depending on the person and the culture, but there's a preoccupation with uh, cosmetics, uh, wanting to see and f be attractive and accepted uh, by other people. Uh, we uh, spend billions in uh, makeup and hair products and clothing products, etc. And I'm not condemning that, I'm just saying that's a reflection of our desire to be accepted and, uh, and apparently or appear attractive to other people. Um, you can also see it too in social media, which can be kind of deceptive. Uh, because social media sort of paints a false positive picture of everyone's lives. You don't generally post things about how you're, you know, the boring parts of your day uh, or the low points or, or mediocre or bland parts of your life. Generally people post things that are seen as incredibly positive like a, a cool trip or a, a day that they thought that they looked really nice or whatever they felt really nice uh, and then they're trying to catalog some cool event or uh, something about their life that they want to share um, and then people that are looking on kind of have this image of everyone's lives are awesome and they're perfect and happy uh, when in actuality that's only a small portion of their life but it can sort of mislead you into thinking that people are much happier or successful uh, and then make yourself feel uh, less confident or happy about your situation. Um, and then we can see that also too uh, with social media, particularly in uh, early teenage life, uh, around middle school and in high school. Um, they noticed since the early 2000s a, a large spike in the amount of psychological disorders uh, regarding depression, anxiety, and, and mood disorders, uh, particularly uh, in uh, girls, but boys too. And they noticed that um, but first of all, they thought that perhaps it was just because people were more open about psychological disorders, but uh, they actually noticed that not only were people talking about it more, uh, but people were being admitted to hospitals for self-harm, suicide attempts, and things like that. Uh, girls, uh, it was about three times higher since the previous generation, so going from millennials back to X-Gen, uh, there's about a three times or so uh, increase, and for boys it was about a... a 61% increase, about one and a half times as many. Uh, so it affected boys too, but it definitely affected uh, young girls a lot more. Uh, so that's something to look out for and to consider going forward, perhaps uh, as a parent in the future.